Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our webinar covering Medicare annual wellness visits. Today's speakers include Blues experts Brandon Vaughn and John Wortley. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them through the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen, as we will have time at the end to answer any questions that come in. All resources from today's presentations, including the slides and recording, will be emailed out to all attendees following the conclusion of our webinar. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, John. John, would you like to get us started? Thank you, Maddie. Yeah, my name is John Wortley, and uh, I'm with Blue and Company. I'm part of the hospital and physician uh, advising team. We, uh, Brandon and I, uh, work with a lot of hospitals, medical groups, and private practices with a lot of their service line development um, or service line enhancements. And today we're going to talk a little bit about annual wellness visits, the Medicare annual wellness visit program, um, and how, how you can benefit from considering this or maybe strengthening um, your organization's position with your annual wellness visit program. The, uh, the, the first thing we do is we typically kind of just identify what is the Medicare annual wellness visit. Uh, most of you are aware that it is a, uh, it's a visit uh, with your primary care provider that's covered by Medicare and Medicare Advantage. It's a, it's a yearly appointment um, that's designed to create and or update uh, a personalized prevention plan. Um, this particular benefit is at no cost to the beneficiary. Um, and it is, is very much um, encouraged by both traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Um, as a lot of us are aware, um, traditional Medicare doesn't cover a, a, an annual physical exam, and some of the Medicare Advantage plans don't, but some do as well. So the, the, in terms of just a couple of, uh, of bullet points, it is not a routine physical, um, and it, it, is, it is very much an in-depth health risk assessment that is designed to find those areas um, for this particular uh, age group and population that may be an issue. Maybe they haven't seen their provider for quite some time. Uh, maybe they haven't had a mammogram or a colonoscopy or another screening service that they, that, that they would be eligible to have. Um, the uh, one thing we always mention is that for traditional primary care practices, um, they can also report a, a evaluation and management code in addition to the uh, annual wellness visit. We don't recommend this in the RHC, FQHC settings um, because you're going to get your PPS rate for each of those visits. And we work with a lot of RHCs who do annual wellness visits. And they typically have a good success rate as we work with them on scheduling those outside of other types of visits uh, where they're gonna see these patients. Um, what's the value um, of the annual wellness visit? Well, the, the first thing we always wanna focus on, on the patient. Um, it really is a benefit to the patient, um, especially traditional Medicare patients. Um, and, and there's a lot of things Brand and I are gonna talk about that that we find during these annual wellness visits that may not have been found if we wouldn't have done the AWV. And, and we want to we wanna help and, and participate in supporting Medicare and Medicare Advantage uh, in doing these so we can, we can help find um, you know, unfortunate things like cancer at maybe stage one or other things that, that can be picked up and, and help people live longer. And that's really the design of the program. On this screen, you see the graph on the left. Um, you can see that um, between 2014 and 2021, the uh, Medicare annual wellness visit participation rate, um, it varied um, from 15% um, up to 23%, dropped back down a little bit during the pandemic. Um, we have seen um, industry leading um, hospital systems uh, with pretty large medical groups get as high as 70, 75% penetration rate. Um, we put the, the many clients at 7% um, because that's really where we see a lot of our clients, the, the, the critical access hospitals, uh, small, medium sized PPS hospitals, where they kind of start um, in that uh, 5 to 7% uh, penetration rate. 
And so there's a lot of other benefits that, that the health system, the hospital, um, and even uh, pr uh, private medical groups, uh, primary care groups can benefit from. Obviously, it aligns with population health management. Um, it improves the uh, quality scores, acuity scores. Um, it identifies additional services, as I mentioned, uh, colonoscopy, Cologuard, uh, other screening services like mammograms, uh, sometimes AAAs. There's other things depending on risk factors and age and so forth that patients are eligible to do. And that equates to about $350 in downstream revenue, either to the practice or to the ho hospital system for every AWV performed. Um, it can pro provide and improve loyalty of the patients to the hospital or to the doctor. Um, uh, reduces readmission rates, uh, improves risk reduction and patient safety. And of course, during the pandemic, um, and it has extended beyond the pandemic, uh, being able to perform these virtually. And Brandon is going to talk a little bit about that. We've had a lot of providers who have been very successful in performing these virtually. Um, good work RVU uh, values for providers. And the practice reimbursement at $172 for the initial AWV and $130 for the subsequent AWV um, is, is pretty good for most practices. And, and of course, in rural health clinic settings, that is going to probably be higher depending on the PPS rate. Um, we wanted to share this because I, I know we've got a, a few uh, uh, financial folks in the audience. Um, it's very typical we see a, a group that's a critical access or small PPS hospital that has 5,000 Medicare lives or Medicare Advantage lives in their panel. And our goal is over a one, two, three year period to help our clients get from that 7%, 5% penetration rate to 50%. And that ultimately becomes worth potentially a million dollars per year for the practice and hospital net revenue. Um, and for most hospital systems, that's that's a nice chunk. And and uh, and our goal in our process that Brandon's going to walk through next is really to to help alleviate some of the uh, the pain points in getting involved in this type of program, um, because we know that many of our our health systems and hospitals may not have the resources to throw at this. So we really try to be to be those resources and to help um, anybody who's interested in, in moving forward with this program really jump in there and, and have us be the feet on the ground that helps them begin the program. So Brandon, I'm gonna hand off the next couple slides to you and you can talk a little bit about how the program it gets developed and, and uh, the areas where we can help. Hello everyone, my name is Brandon Bond. I am considered your boots on the ground guy uh, when, you're, when you're looking at starting a program like this. Um, where Blue can come in and help, as John stated before, is that most hospitals that we work with don't have the resources to kind of throw at an annual wellness visit program. What we like to do is, is basically come on in, introduce ourselves, um, and, and we do what we call an on-site assessment. Uh, during that on-site assessment, we will interview staff, talk to a point person, um, anybody that needs to be in the room that are that can be affected by the annual wellness visit. So your physical therapy, your your AAA screening people, your colon, colonoscopy people, all those, we get them in a room and let them know that they could potentially see an influx or increase in their visit volume um, and how this could either benefit them or it could be a potential barrier if they have access issues or whatever the case may be. Um, once we get in the room with them and start to discuss this, we could be, begin to formulate a plan, whether that be to help improve access, um, we could talk about a communication plan where we could start sending out letters to the patients, how we could start scheduling these visits, and, and basically working through any workflow issues that we might have um, in doing these sort of visits. From there, uh, essentially what we'll do is, is pick a pilot site, um, and, and myself and a couple members of the team will go out to that pilot site and begin to work with them from the front office all the way through the back office. So how do we call and schedule these patients? Are, are we sending letters out to these patients? Um, if patients are coming in already with letters, so what you'll see is with a lot of these insurance companies, they'll come in with letters stating that, hey, we have um, received this letter from, from Anthem and they said, I need to get this visit for $100. How do we work through that um, and making sure that it's scheduled correctly? From there, what we'll do is, uh, 
get that pilot up and going um, where whether I'm helping room patients and, and doing those on-site assessments with, with the docs um, or a member of my team doing that, um, where, where we'll sit down and, and work through all those objectives. One of the, the, the key things that we, we really like to do in this, op, in this situation is, is the EMR opportunity. So a lot of the EMRs do not have the greatest templates for annual wellness visits. Um, what we'll do is we work with a lot of the EMR systems. We will actually help develop the template that works best for your hospital um, and, and get things in there, the triggers that are needed for those patients. So for example, if, you, if we have a patient that comes in and needs physical therapy, there should be a trigger within that annual wellness visit template that basically lets the, the doc schedule or, or create that order right off the spot and it should go to that physical therapy department and help the patient get scheduled right there in the office. We, we see it continuously where we don't, um, where we don't have those types of things in place and we're able to work with the epics the cerners um, the metatechs of the world and get that built for you you want to move on to the next slide john so as john said uh over the course of one two or three years we, we break this out in phases um in the first phase we call that our building blocks phase that's where we're doing that on-site assessment we're doing we're developing the communication plan the steering committee because we all know that if you don't have buy-in for this type of program, you know, what tends to happen is we'll get started and then it just, it falls by the wayside. It's not something that can continue on. We want to make sure that over the course of the three years and then even after we are gone, that this is something that you guys are able to continue developing that, that EHR, EMR content for you all to make sure that it's easy for the docs, easy for the staff. Um, and then doing a, a capacity analysis Kind of talked about that before where we're making sure that access is not an issue for these um and in most cases it's not but in some cases where can we fit in these virtual visits and things of that nature to make sure that these gets done phase two and phase three uh kind of coincide with one another where stakeholder buy-in and the rollout using that pilot site um and, and having success with that pilot site and providing the workflow that, that works best for, for the location um, is, is key in, in this environment. Um, because like you said, once you start hitting barriers with annual wellness visits, like it, it could fall by the wayside. So developing the, that, that the workflow and making sure that it works well in a, in a few separate locations with a few docs is always key for us here. And once, once we do that, we could roll it out to all the clinics. We'll give you a toolkit. We call it our annual wellness tool, visit toolkit where you'll have different codes, what are, the, what are the, the tests that are involved with the annual wellness visit? Um, how, can you, how can you build this and things of that nature to help docs along the way and, and give you a workflow flow sheet, essentially, so that when these types of patients come in, that is easy to work through. From there, we are in phase four where we are monitoring. So, so myself, John, um, on occasion will always be available um, for staff and, and, and docs whenever they have questions and things of that nature. Um, and from there, we're just making sure that the, the program is able to, 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 to succeed well beyond our time there. Next slide. Yep. Thanks, Brandon. Um, the, uh, as Brandon mentioned, that, that the phase one through four of implementation, really phase one through three is kind of that, that zero to, to six months. And then of course, in that third phase, we're beginning to roll it out to the other uh, practices that are in your medical group. Um, and that's really where it, it, it takes a little time. Um, we've Brandon's going to go over some case studies where we've seen some success um, that can be as little as a year to get to 50% penetration rate, or it can take as long as two years. Um, and we've had, we've had some groups where it's taken three years to get them to 40, 50%, maybe because of their size and geography. Um, one thing that we do, um, and I know this is pretty small, but um, is we do a financial estimate. Um, so an AWB calculator is what we call it, where we take the, the, the client's primary care providers. Um, we look either at the data that, that the client sends us. Sometimes the client will send us their, their uh, primary care providers, their nurse practitioners, PAs, and physicians, uh, and their NPI numbers. And then, then we will go through and, and we will examine with the claims data that we have access to, 
um, that's all Medicare claims um, and a, a, a really high percentage in many cases of commercial claims, which is where the Advantage plans would show up. And we can compare um, those two codes, the GO438 and GO439, um, the, the, the AWV initial and AWV uh, subsequent, to see how many over a, a one year period of time that the system may have done. Then we can make some estimates on a current penetration rate. Um, let's say that may be 4% or 5%. Um, in this particular case, it was a pretty large client. They have almost 40 primary care providers. And they had a very large 20,000 estimated Medicare and Medicare Advantage enrollees. Um, to get them to 25% from 4%, it was going to be about $2.2 million in additional net revenue. To get to 35%, it was going to be $3 million. And if they can get to 50 and stay there, it would be 4.5 million. So it was, a, it was quite an undertaking for this group and uh, we're still in the process of, of working with them. But it, 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 we can get the data a couple ways. We can get it from our clients uh, where we have their providers, their MPIs and their number of, of uh, annual wellness visits they performed in the prior year. Or we can go through and gather that from the access we have to that claims data. So from here, we're kind of going to talk about uh, what does it look like um, case study wise and uh, when you bring Blue in to do something like this. Um, and, and the pieces of the puzzle, they'll all fit together at the end. We'll, we go from dysfunctional possibly to and a need for alignment to at the end, all the pieces fit together. So if you want to move on to the next slide for me. And in these cases, these are all actual client experiences. Um, that, that we've done. As you can see, we have a few uh, critical access hospitals in here and then a couple PPS hospitals. So in our first one, uh, it looks like they had around 6,600 Medicare or Medicare Advantage lives. Uh, they started off prior to us coming in with a 4% penetration rate. In years one and two, uh, we were able to get them to 46%, um, which is a quite a large jump. And then finally in year three, we crossed that 50% uh, threshold and got them to 57%. So within those three years, they were looking at 1.4 mil, million to 1.9 million in additional net revenue. Uh, another- Per year. Per year. Yeah. Um, another uh, an example too, a critical access hospital with about 2,700 Medicare, Medicare and Medicare Advantage lives. Uh, looks like they're at 2% when we first started. Um, in year one, we were able to get them about 40%. Um, at the end of year two, uh, they were at 52%, and, and they had around between 400 and 700,000 in additional net revenue a year. Uh, example three is another PPS hospital, of about 7,000, 7, 7,500 Medicare lives. Uh, they started at 5%. Um, we, what we did here is we actually had two assessment that were, assessments that were performed for them in 2019 and 2020 um, using the data. Uh, what we learned from the assessment is that they were currently sitting at, at 6%. Um, they, they haven't had much improvement due to limited resources and, and workflow and EMR optimization, but it's a client that we've been able to, to identify and are looking to help out in the near future uh, to get them over that hump. And, and an example- hey, Brandon, for them, if I could just interrupt real quick. Yep. That, that number three is, is a client that- uh, it, They've got, they've got a, a, some pretty good resources and they really felt like if we gave them the roadmap, they, they could be successful and, and uh, within their own groups, uh, managing and, and being able to do these. And, and, uh, and they've tried that. They, they have asked us to come back down and take another look. Um, sometimes with, with, with the smaller, uh, even PPS hospitals, the, the, the issue really is if you've got practice managers that you're expecting to do one more thing, it just becomes more and more difficult, and, and especially if they've not done them before. Um, and I know that sounds self-serving, but we, we try to be that extra set of hands and feet and, 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 um, and some maybe some skill set that we can teach and, and, and hand off you know, the, 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 the keys to the kingdom, if you will, um, for success. I'm sorry, Brandon, go ahead with that fourth. But yeah, and as John said, that, that one more th thing, uh, I used to be a practice manager in a previous life. So when, when you ask us, to, do, you know, sometimes it just becomes one of those barriers and it just falls by the wayside, as I say before. So an example four is another critical access hospital uh, around 3,100 Medicare lives. 
Um, it looks like we started off at 1% with them. Um, and in, in one year, that was one of the examples that John told you in one year, we were able to get them to 50% um, and, and have monitored them along the way. And they pretty much stayed there from, from correct, right, John? Um, and, and they're looking at between 520 and 600,000 in, in the first year of net revenue. And, and this is where, like I said, the, the pieces of that puzzle all fit together. At the end of the day, we call this a win-win-win situation. It's a good. It's good for the patients. It's good for the system, um, and and then it's it's good for the docs at the end of the day to to do these types of visits. And and it's something that Blue has has developed since I've been here four and a half years now, and and we've gotten pretty good at it. So, uh, next slide. So now we are at the, the section where if you guys have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer those and, and talk to anybody about next steps. Thank you, John and Brandon. So we did have had a couple of questions come in. Um, so we do have one question specific to RHC. So um, just to clarify, if a location is a registered RHC, we cannot charge a, um, G0438 or G0439 and an additional EM code if it if the acute or chronic illnesses were addressed during this visit. Well, let me let me just say that it, it's not that you can't, it's just that you're not going to get paid for it. Um, so you could you could theoretically do both of those. Um, but you, you, if you, as you recall, being an RHC, you're only going to get that PPS rate for one visit. Um, and, you know, some things that some of our providers do for like uh, blood pressure checks and Brandon can walk through this is that for very minor visits, um, some of our RHCs decide to go ahead and do the annual wellness visit. Um, and then the because the blood pressure check is part of that. Um, but if you're doing a, a pretty high level, a 99214, um, and you would decide to do that uh, G0438 or G0439, you can do that in terms of helping with all those things we we mentioned, um, but there's there's not going to be the benefit of being able to be reimbursed for both those. We've had good success in 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 scheduling or rescheduling most folks to come back for their AWB or do it virtually. Yep, and that's what I was going to say. Usually in those situations, we'll allow, we want to keep that that high level visit, um, and then see if we can reschedule that patient back for a virtual visit the next day or sometime in the near future. Thank you. Um, is there a minimum time that the provider has to be in the room for the annual wellness visit? I'll take that one, John. Uh, so typically, that's usually one of the barriers that we face. Um, we like to schedule these appointments for at least 30 minutes. Um, and and the majority, I would say 90% of the visit is done by either that the medical assistant or the nurse on staff. Um, if, if in a perfect world, I would like the doc to be in the room for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but in some in some sense instances, the doc can be in there a little bit longer. But it's all about training the workflow um, and knowing that the medical staff should be taking care of 90, 90 to 95% of that visit before the doc even, even gets in the room. Thank you. And then um, does the provider have to be the one that completes the annual wellness visit? You want me to answer that one, John? Or Sure, either one. Yeah. Okay. Um, typically, um, like I said, the, the medical staff, that nurse or the uh, medical assistant is doing 90 to 95% of that visit. Um, in most cases, it could be a provider, nurse practitioner, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant. Um, we've even seen um, a pharmacist can, can do them as well. Nurse midwives could do these visits. Um, so no, it doesn't have to be necessarily an MD that, that completes these visits. And, and we provide all that kind of information in the beginning. Because um, in some cases, we might need to set up a what we call a quote unquote annual wellness visit clinic. <laughs> and it might not be ran by MD. It might be the pharmacist or uh, physician assistant. So no. And the the only follow up I, I would have to that is, you know, it's it's ultimately billed under the, the licensed medical provider. So they do have to be involved. Um, as Brandon said, it's usually 10 minutes or so um, of, of their time. And uh, 
So that that's that's certainly something that that we walk through with everybody involved. So another question that's come in is, can you kind of explain more the virtual part of um, how these visits could be done virtually? So does this mean that the patient needs to be on a computer or can these be done via telephone as most elderly patients might not have access to a computer? So during the during the pandemic, uh, they did open these up to being done via telephone. Um, that I believe that's been extended uh, up through through next March, I believe, if, if I'm correct. Um, so yes, you can do these over the phone, but uh, if you have an iPhone or access to a computer, we would like to, to lay eyes on the patient. Um, so typically, if we are going to do a virtual visit, this might be someone that came in and had a, an acute issue, um, and, and we did not keep it as an AWV. We, we addressed the acute issue. Um, so the next day, we would give them a call and run through the health risk assessment with the patient. Um, at that point, it, it's a lot of self-reporting. Um, so self-reporting blood pressure, self-reporting um, different issues and, and being able to, to take pictures with the phone or show something to the camera of during that, that mini cog for the patient. So it, it's an entirely different workflow. <laughs> um, and, and so it's something like when you bring blue on, it's something that I've been able to help clients with. Um, I'm, I'm here out in Indianapolis. And so it's been something that I've been able to help clients in Kentucky get done, um, before we, we transition them over to the doc, um, for them to sign off on everything. So, uh, it's, it's, it can be done. It's a different workflow. Um, and it's not something that we normally introduce right, right away, but it's something that that's been very beneficial and helpful for our clients. Thank you, Brandon. No problem. Um, so how often can an annual wellness visit be completed on like a certain patient? So yearly um, is the, the simple answer to that one. Um, over the past, I want to say in the last year or so, a lot of insurance companies have, have switched. Um, and so some insurance companies are going by calendar year now. So for example, if you got your annual wellness visit done on December 31st for your initial, you could come January 1 for your for your subsequent. Um, it hasn't always, that hasn't always been the case. It's always been 365 days, 366 days after your last one. Um, but you know, for most insurance companies now, they are going by calendar year. So you could get it, get it done, like I said, December 31st and come back on January 1. But we would like to see it done every year. And we do develop different workflows where, you know, usually around clients' birthdays or patients' birthdays and things of that nature. Um, another question came in. So um, can you explain kind of Blue's process? So what does Blue get paid to complete the assessment slash like boots on the groundwork at the arm in the office. Um, so then can you also kind of say, talk about how, when you start, when a facility would start to see revenue on any given annual wellness visit? Yeah, I, I think the, the there, there's really two parts of, of what we do at Blue. The, the assessment is typically a, a fixed fee um, based upon kind of the size of the organization. Um, the, the smaller the organization, the, the usually the, the less because there's not a lot more travel for us and it, it's, a, it's a little smaller, con more contained group when we're doing a, an assessment for a critical access hospital than a larger PPS hospital that may have 40 or 50 uh, primary care providers. Um, so we usually, uh, in our proposals or our engagement letters, um, we have an assessment component that is a fixed fee um, and then we have the implementation component that it, it, once the, the client determines they want to move forward with the implementation, once the, we have kind of mutually identified the opportunity that exists, um, then we have a, a, an implementation engagement um, where we look at how much time we think it's going to be being on site, um, how long we think this is going to take moving from um, you know, 5% to 25% and then 35%. 
Um, one thing we have had happen um, is, and this is a good thing, um, Brandon and, and, and his team have actually been able to be um, to move folks to like 30 or 35 percent in six months. Um, and, you know, we just want to make sure we, when we talk to our clients that they want us to continue at that same pace, um, which may, you know, uh, move the fees up a little bit, but it gets us to 50 percent and kind of gets blew out of the way sooner, too. Um, so it, it really kind of depends on the size of the organization and the, the time and resources that, that we have involved in terms of the fees. But we're happy to, to kind of share with anybody what that looks like for their organization if there are specific questions on how that would go. Thank you, John. Um, right now, that's all the questions we've had come in, but we'll give it a few more minutes just to see if any more come through. And Maddie, you did say you're going to you're going to send out the presentation to the attendees. Yes. So everyone will get a copy of the um, slides and then a recording if you want to go back through and listen through it. And our contact information is uh, on the presentation. If there's any questions, uh, Brandon and I or somebody on our team are happy to to sit down and walk through your individual situations, see where you're at today. Um, see, you know, because sometimes, honestly, we, we we do an assessment for a client. And they are already doing well, and they've implemented some things pretty well. And sometimes we we tell them they're they're well on the path um, to success, and we may offer them some support in some minor ways. But um, it, that's something that that we want to make sure we do as well. If somebody's got things going down the right track, we want to just help them continue on. Thank you, John. So. Um... As a reminder, if you have any more questions, feel free to use the speaker's information located in the slides that'll be emailed out later today. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, thank you and have a great day. Thank, thank you. you.